This morning's service will follow the common service that begins on page 15 in the front of our hymnal. However, the opening hymn, hymn 712, is found in the blue supplement. Uh, this is a hymn we've sung a couple of times before, and it is a hymn that will appear in the new, or is in the new Christian worship uh, hymnal, which uh, we'll start to use at some point in the hopefully not distant future. Uh, but we'll begin our service this morning with the ring of the bells and then sing our opening hymn. Please note for the communion hymns uh, on the outside of your worship folder, it says hymns 98 and 86. It should be 96 and 86, not 98. So 96 and 86 will be the communion distribution hymns. We'll begin, though, with the ring of the bells and say hymn 712. Therefore, 
as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
our gospel is veiled, it is veiled among those who are perishing. In the case of those people, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from clearly seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is God's image. Indeed, we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For the God who said, light will shine out of darkness, is the same one who made light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. This ends our epistle lesson. Alleluia. A voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel is taken from St. Luke in the ninth chapter, beginning with the 28th verse. About eight days after he had said these words, Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. While he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothing became dazzling white. Just then, two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They appeared in glory and were talking about his departure, which he was going to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were weighed down with sleep, but when they were completely awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not realize what he was saying. While he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. They were afraid as they went into the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. After the voice had spoken, they found Jesus alone. They kept this secret and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. This ends the gospel lesson. We confess our Christian faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day, hymn number 97.
Turn our attention this morning again to the Gospel from Luke chapter 9. While he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothing became dazzling white. Just then, two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They appeared in glory and were talking about his departure, which he was going to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. This is the Word of God. Dear friends in Jesus Christ, our Lord, about a week and a half ago, Lydia and I were talking on the phone about a whole bunch of different things, and during the course of the conversation, she mentioned that uh, while she was watching TV just a couple days earlier, she'd seen an ad for an upcoming Agatha Christie movie. And she knows that I'm a fan of Ms. Christie's fictional detective, Hercule Poirot. And so she thought it might be interesting to me, and I said, yeah, I saw that ad too. And yes, it looked like it'd be interesting, and, and yes, I might even be willing to go to the theater and spend the money on the big bucket of popcorn and the movie ticket to watch this one, even though I rarely go to a movie. But we've all seen these. We're watching television, and a preview comes on for an upcoming movie. Could be one that's part of a series of movies, could be a, a one of its kind, a one of a kind movie, doesn't matter. But the people who produce it and put together the preview want to get your attention, to pique our interest. So there's maybe a scene with some really intriguing action or deep dialogue. So that we'll eventually, when the movie does finally come to theaters, go out, spend our money, take our time, and watch it. The Word of God for our consideration this morning is a series of events that took place recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All of them talked about what had happened about a week earlier. And they continue on with Jesus' ministry following this event, but this is an occasion where God gives us a preview. Like a little bit of an interlude in the narrative of the scriptures, God gives us a preview of his son's glory, of his son's glorious work, and of the glory that will be for those who follow his son. Luke's account tells us that as Jesus was praying on this mountain with Peter, John, and James, his appearance of his face changed and his clothing became dazzling white. In the NIV it says like a, a flash of lightning, extremely bright, brighter than anybody could ever have watched them. And here the Lord gives us a preview of the true glory of his son, Jesus Christ. Peter, James, and John had been with Jesus for almost three years now. They had gotten little hints of his glory when he fed the 5,000, when he walked on water, when he raised Jairus' daughter, and, and all of the other miracles. They would seen just a, a peek of what he could do, recognizing that this was no ordinary rabbi. They'd heard the sermons described by many who heard him as ones that came with authority. And they realized this was no ordinary preacher. And yet, despite all of that, Peter, James, and John had also seen Jesus sitting down and eating, falling asleep in the back of their boat, going away and resting for a while. They saw a man who looked a lot like they did dressed like an ordinary Jewish man in the first century. Same sandals as they had, dark hair, likely a beard, olive skin. Looked all the world like an ordinary person that you'd meet walking down the street in Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Nazareth, or anywhere else. And they had also seen people who didn't agree with Jesus. And they were probably used to that. They knew that people don't always get along with other people, and not everybody seemed to agree with Jesus. Well, okay, pretty typical of human interaction. He looked so ordinary in so many ways. But not today. On this occasion, the veil of Jesus' humanity, which was not really the way Jesus is. Jesus really isn't that Jewish-looking guy walking down the street. The real Jesus, the way Jesus really is in his essence, was seen here on this mountain. As the veil of humanity is pulled back a little further, and they see his face shining like the sun, 
His clothes dazzling white. This is the Jesus whom the angels praise in heaven. This is the Jesus who for all eternity received the praise of his angels. Who has all power in his person. Who is God himself. And the disciples got to see that for a few moments. No wonder Peter said, Lord, it's really good to be here. This is great. I probably wouldn't have wanted to leave either. And he had a good idea. He's going to make three tents. One for Jesus and one for the two visitors. Each. And now we'll stay here. Was Peter's idea. We see Jesus' glory revealed not before our eyes, but before the eyes of our faith, on the pages of Scripture too, as God pulls back the veil a little bit at different times, so that we see Jesus not an ordinary person, not one in a long line of human philosophers, teachers, but as someone different, as we know him to be true God. And that's essential because, after all, your hope of salvation and mine are based solely upon this Jesus Christ. And if he is just another philosopher, well, that doesn't do us much good. If he's just another teacher in the long line of the world's great teachers, some of whom you may have had when you sat in a classroom in grade school, high school, or college, that doesn't do us a whole lot of good either when it comes to our eternity. But this Jesus upon whom our entire hope of heaven is built is not just that. He is God himself as we see him here. And God gave us this preview of Jesus' glory. And he also gives us a preview of the glory of Jesus' work. Because that's what Moses and Elijah were there for. Discussing with him what he was going to endure in Jerusalem in about six to eight more weeks his upcoming suffering. What the details of their conversation were, the Bible doesn't tell us. Perhaps, as Moses chimed in with Jesus, he reminded the Lord, not that, that Jesus would forget, but he brought up the fact that, you know, I told the Israelites that, that God would raise up a prophet like me from among his own people to whom they should listen. And, and clearly, Jesus, you're, you're that prophet. It's good that you came, and I'm glad to see some of the people listening to you. We hope they'll continue. And all of those laws that, that I had given to the people when I came down from Mount Sinai, that, that they weren't able to keep, that I myself, or I couldn't keep them either, Jesus, you know that. But you did. You've kept them to this point, and we know you're going to keep them right up to the end, and that's what we need. And yes, we know you're going to suffer, we know it's going to, be, <clears throat> going to be horrible because that's what the Bible in the Old Testament scriptures said would happen. But we also know that you will prevail. We're looking forward to that. We had put our hope in that, right, Elijah? Well, certainly Moses. Elijah chimed in. And then Elijah may have also chimed in with some of his own statements because he too had seen God's glory revealed at times, while hidden at other times. Have you ever wondered why Moses and Elijah were there? I mean, why those two? Why not David and Isaiah? Why not Solomon and Abraham? Why not Jacob and Jeremiah? We don't know. But Bible scholars give us some ideas that, that these two men were there because in the Jewish mind, Moses and Elijah were the two greatest prophets of the Old Testament. That might be one reason. It might be a reason because both of these men spent time in the presence of God at the same place. Moses at Mount Sinai, Elijah fled to Mount Horeb, it's the same mountain. Moses stood in the presence of God and twice received the Ten Commandments. Elijah hid in a cave, and when God called him out of the cave, Elijah had to cover his face because he couldn't stand the sight of being in the presence of God who was just whispering to him. Both of these men led the people of God at various times. Moses led them out of Egypt for 40 years into the wilderness 
Elijah was the spiritual leader of the people of Israel during the divided kingdom. When things were at a very low point, when wicked King Ahab and his wickeder wife Jezebel were leading the people into false belief and Baal worship at an astonishing rate. Both of these men had seen little glimpses of God's glory. Moses to the degree that his face shone, as we were told from Exodus. Elijah, he got to do that really neat competition with the prophets of Baal when they built altars and offered sacrifice and prayed, and they prayed to Baal and he prayed to God, and they prayed to Baal and nothing happened, of course, and he prayed to God and God rained down fire from heaven and it consumed the sacrifice that Elijah had put on the altar, consumed the wood that was on top of the stones, consumed the stones, licked up the water that was all around it. It was pretty cool. I'm sure Elijah thought. It was just after that, Jezebel put a price on his head, and he fled to Horeb. Both of these men had had opportunities to see a little bit of God's glory during their earthly lives. They also shared something else that was rather unique. Moses died and was buried by God himself on Mount Nebo, across the Jordan River having gotten a panoramic view of the promised land. The only person scripture ever tells us that God himself buried. Elijah, we know, was never buried, but simply taken up alive into heaven in a chariot of fire. So both of these individuals came to a rather unique earthly end. And maybe that's why they were there. But they were talking about what Jesus was going to accomplish, and the glory of that, the suffering that he would endure, yes, the pain, the agony, but the glory of accomplishing salvation for all of humanity. The reason Moses and Elijah could even be in heaven in the first place was because of what Jesus was going to do long after they lived here on earth. And the reason you and I will one day be in heaven is because of the glorious work Jesus did long before we were ever born. But it's the same work. To accomplish our salvation, having paid for all of our sins, having lived the perfect life for us, and then offering himself on the cross. And so here we see a little glimpse, not only of Jesus' glory, not only of the glory of that amazing work that he was going to do for every single man, woman, and child the world over, the billions of us that are alive today and have ever lived. But you also get to see a little bit of our own glory, the glory of a follower of Jesus. Moses and Elijah were examples of that. There they stood, <clears throat> recognizable to the disciples by some means. Obviously Moses and Elijah had never been met by Peter, James, or John. Don't imagine they had accurate pictures of them in their little Bible history books that they studied at uh, school. But there they were. And the three disciples knew who they were. And they were there because of what Jesus had done for them. They were there because they had placed their confidence and their hope and their trust in Jesus throughout their ministries. They'd been, do, been through some really tough times. Remember Moses during those 40 years? Remember as you read through the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers as well? And even into Deuteronomy, how many times the Israelites grumbled and complained about Moses? Oh, bring us out in the desert to die. We don't like the bread. We don't like the meat. Rebel, rebel. And they complained. And it got so bad that one time when Moses was told to hit a rock, he struck it. Maybe taking out his frustrations, maybe imagining the face of every Israelite he dealt with in that rock for that moment. And that's why God said, you will not enter the promised land. You will see it, but you will not enter because you disobeyed me. Moses had dealt with a lot. He'd seen a lot of frustration. He'd experienced a lot of rejection and discouragement and physical suffering. But he always placed his confidence in the Lord. Elijah. Winning that great victory at Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal would have been easily a hero among all the believers of God's people. But instead he had to flee for his life because of what the queen said. 
And so he did. And then when he was at Mount Horeb, he lamented his situation. Oh, Lord, I want to die. He was been through a lot of difficult times, and he would go through even more. But he always trusted that the Lord would be with him. And so, dear friends, you and I, as modern followers of the Lord, go through difficult times in our lives. They might come in ways we never expected. They might come at times we never could have seen coming. They may come when we're young and, and they last an entire lifetime. We may go through life quite comfortably for the most part, but then at the very end, things get less than pleasant. Doesn't matter when they come or how they come, but challenges will come. Our faith will be challenged. We see the world in which we live and, and we see the chaos that reigns throughout this world. The crime in America, the fighting overseas, and the devil begins to tell us, maybe your Lord isn't so powerful after all. Maybe your Lord doesn't care for you as much as you think he does. Maybe your Lord isn't as powerful and caring and competent and loving as he tells you he is. And we see trouble in our own lives and the lives of others. And God gives us a preview of the glory that is ours to encourage us and to remind us that he hasn't forgotten us. He didn't forget Moses, he didn't forget Elijah. He doesn't forget you, he doesn't forget me. We may go through some difficulties, in fact, the Apostle Paul says just that, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Many hardships that come in many forms, but we enter the kingdom of God. We will have glory one day. God gives us that preview on this mountain just to encourage us, just to strengthen our faith and our trust in him so uh, we do not lose hope in a world that looks awfully hopeless an awful lot of the time. Now maybe when the previews come on, like so often we do when the commercials come on, uh, we get up, use the bathroom, get something out of the fridge, grab a bag of chips out of the pantry. That's the great thing about commercials. They allow us to do stuff that's important like that and then get back to the show. But in so doing, we might miss the preview for a coming attraction that would be really important to see. Entertaining, fun. God gives us a preview, dear friends. He invites us not to get up and go get a bag of chips or use the bathroom, but to watch it, to take it to heart, to realize the preview is meant just for us. It's not something he's giving for himself, but for you and for me, so that we do not lose heart. Because God gives us a preview of glory, his son's glory, the glorious work of his son, and your glory too. Because one day, you, by the grace of God, will be standing there with Jesus, with Moses, with Elijah. And you will be able to say, it is good to be here. And I don't even have to build a shelter, because my Lord has already prepared one. And you can talk about his previous work that would be accomplished and has been accomplished in Jerusalem. You can talk about whatever you want because you're going to have a long time to spend with your Lord in glory. And he gives you a preview of it right here. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Dearest Jesus, who in love laid down your life for our sins, we humbly desire to return your love and offer our thanks through these gifts. By your infinite wisdom and gracious will, help them to further the preaching of the gospel to souls which your blood has bought. May we always give our gifts with sincerity and generosity, moved by your love for us and our love for you. Amen. Heavenly Father, on the Mount of Transfiguration, you revealed your Son's glory in part, so that the disciples would be encouraged and have their faith strengthened. You gave your personal verbal endorsement of Jesus and called upon his followers to listen to him. May we too, who at times can fail to see Jesus' glory because of the thought, the troubles in our world, and the temptations of Satan, be comforted and strengthened by the glorious sight of your Son in the presence of Moses and Elijah. Give us courage to withstand the assaults of the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh, which only try to rob us of the glory which you have prepared for all of your people. Keep us faithful to the end, that we too may receive the crown of life. Special prayers are offered this morning on behalf of Mr. Henry Leibel, who is currently hospitalized. Also, Mr. David Smith, who was hospitalized but was able to go uh, home last week. We remember our prayers also of Mrs. Narita Miller, who will be undergoing some tests uh, this coming week. And lastly, we keep in mind our brothers and sisters uh, in Ukraine as they face tremendous difficulty during their war. Compassionate Lord, we come to you this morning on behalf of Mr. Henry Leibel, hospitalized after a fall. We thank you that his injuries were not more serious. We ask that you would give wisdom, care, and insight to the medical staff attending to his needs, so that they proceed with a plan that will cause Henry a minimum of discomfort and as quickly and a complete recovery as possible. As his physical strength returns, bless him with a spiritual strength that never doubts your love for him. We thank you also for the improvement to the health of Mr. David Smith, that he was able to leave the hospital early last week. Continue to be with David as he has returned to Nishanic Manor in West Salem. Remind him of your love and care for him. We thank you for the staff that looks after David's needs and ask that you would continue to give them wisdom and compassion. And Lord, as Mrs. Narita Miller faces a heart test this coming Monday and then a procedure forthcoming, we pray that you would bless the medical means employed on her behalf. Give wisdom and insight to the doctors and nurses who will care for her. Grant Narita, bless Narita that she is not overcome with fear or anxiety. Be with her family as well during this time and remind them that their loved one is not only in the competent hands of doctors and nurses who have trained for years, but is also in your competent and caring hands as well. And that you will let nothing happen to your children that is not in keeping with your will and our eternal good. And Lord, we approach your throne today with a special prayer on behalf of the people of Ukraine and Russia. For reasons that we may not completely know or understand, one nation has invaded another. We ask that you direct the affairs of this situation as you see fit. If it be your will, bring this conflict to a swift end. We especially ask that you keep our brothers and sisters in Christ who are part of the Ukrainian Lutheran Church safe during this war. Spare them in body and in property so that they might continue to proclaim the true and lasting peace which is found only in your Son, Jesus Christ. This and all these and all our prayers we bring in Jesus' name, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Communion, uh, communion liturgy continues on page 21 of the hymnal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only Son, full of grace and truth. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.